Hello mga ka -Eco. I am Jose Roland Moya. The Employers Confederation of the Philippines, or ECOP, is here to ensure that your voice as employers is heard, articulated, and acted upon. ECOP addresses industrial relations issues, promotes social dialogue, and fosters proactive collaboration among employers and stakeholders. We are here to help employers become responsible, sustainable, and inclusive. ECOP has dual functions. First is its advocacy and lobbying role on labor and social policy issues on behalf of employers before the executive and legislative branches of the government. Second is the delivery of direct services including training, capacity building, consultancy, provision of information, among others. By the way, wag po kayong aalis! Manood po tayo sa buong programa. Sagutin ang aming Echo Plus question for the day. I-post ang tamang sagot sa Facebook account ng Echo at manalo ng premyo. May I introduce to you my co-host in our episode of our digital TV program, Ms. Sheila Marie Ramos, OSH Coordinator and Specialist of the Employers Confederation of the Philippines. Mga ka -Eco, welcome to Echo Plus Amplifying Your Voice every other Monday at 5.30pm. Our episode today is about mental health in the workplace. The COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing economic downturn have had a detrimental impact on many people's mental health and created new barriers for those who already suffer from mental illnesses. There is still a stigma attached to disclosing employee mental health condition in many organizations. However, the pandemic has provided unexpected opportunity for HR employees and senior leadership to have more open and supportive talks. Ngayong gabi, alamin ng iba't ibang impormasyon mula sa ating subject matter experts. Ang unang makakasama natin ay si Assistant Secretary Maria Teresita Cocueco. Uh, Dr. Maria Teresita Cocueco is Assistant Secretary, the Regional Operations, Labor Standards and Special Concerns, and concurrently Director of the Bureau of Working Conditions, Department of Labor and Employment. Magandang gabi sa iyo, Dr. Tess. Welcome to Echo Plus, Amplifying Your Voice. Uh, batiin nyo naman po ang mga nanunood ng ating episode ngayon. Good evening, Roland, at sa lahat ng mga nanunood dito, lalo na sa inyo this event. I would really like to greet all of you a good evening and thank you for inviting Nadole to be part in sharing, of course, whatever we can share in terms of policy issuances that concerns all of you. Good evening, ASEC Tess. Let us use the guidelines on the implementation of flexible working arrangements as the takeoff point for our discussion. Tell us more about this. Did employers and workers find this issuance helpful, especially at the height of the pandemic? What complaints, if any, did you receive from either of them about its implementation? Hello, Sheila. And yes, as we speak, Dole did issue Labor Advisory 9 series of 2020 during the pandemic. And this was an issuance on flexible working arrangement to help companies allow them to operate looking at alternatives to work. I will mention that in a while. Better than outright termination of their employees or closure of the establishments. Remember, with the pandemic, economies really stopped except for essential services that were allowed. In the beginning, as we had to learn from the virus and we had not, except for the protection, that we were able to look into the provision of the minimum public health standards. Transmission was very high, infection was also very high, and to isolate ourselves and to provide that quarantine, remember we had to go on the ECQ. Companies were not open, so there were no customers, no consumers, and there were still, they had to deal with employees, and so that the companies can still continue to operate because they could there was that flexible work arrangement that was issued which provide the companies some work arrangements like reduction of work hours rotation of workers and force leave as alternative work arrangements in order that you know they can still be open and the workers can continue to work less than hours but minimum wage or the, their wages 
would still be there, but it will be now computed on the number of hours and the number of days that they were able to work. So this was one of the measures that we had to bring in right away. And the only questions we had then was on its implementation. But really, this many companies were very grateful for this because it allowed some leeway, some flexibility for them to be able to continue to operate, to continue to provide their wages so that the workers can continue to work, even during this very difficult time in the beginning of the pandemic. Asek Tess, ano yung mga naging challenges sa pagpapatupad nitong uh, labor advisory na to no, on uh, flexible work arrangements? You know, the Dole had to bring in a system immediately kasi together with this was of course financial assistance to these companies and to the workers actually who were on this flexible work arrangement. They had to register, so we had to go on an online system. This was part of ano eh, kumbaga, catalyzing or putting in place right away a digital transformation so that online companies who were doing this flexible work arrangement they will put the, their employees who are part of this flexible work arrangement once it's registered with the dollar with the regional offices then they can receive those financial assistance that the dollar was able to provide not just for those flexible work arrangements they also have to deal with companies who really close and of course that financial assistance was really needed more for those that had to terminate workers because of the closure of the establishments but even for those with flexible work arrangement those workers who were affected still had financial assistance so we had to immediately put that in but because we already had a system of an online reporting system in the dole it did not take long and companies were able to immediately register their workers, those who were in the, those who had flexible work arrangements, and it was given to the region so that the financial assistance would be given. Um, that was the first step. But that was really the biggest challenge, but ultimately we were able to provide the necessary means. And then, you know, lang, um, how the manner in which this assistance reached the workers, it was with the regions already, so that all of this assistance could properly reach the workers who were affected. Uh, Doc Tess, based sa uh, experience o sa karanasan ng uh, Department of Labor and Employment sa uh, pagpapatupad ng flexible work arrangements, lalo na nung kasagsaga ng uh, pandemic, meron bang dapat itweak sa nabanggit na labor advisory upang ito ay lalong maging mas uh, makabuluhan at kapakipakinabang sa mga employers at maging sa mga manggagawa? From our experience, kasi kami lang naman yung program manager, on the ground, on the regional operations where it was going to be implemented, I think it was really perhaps the system of having the workers access to financial assistance, maybe we're, we should also be looking at a better way of providing that financial assistance. But short of that, in terms of the needed information, the registration, I think we had our, um, we didn't have any bigger problems. But if you're looking at operations and its implementation, maybe that would be more of an internal and possibly if there would be a better mechanism of an online delivery of cashless disbursement and having the then that would really be policy measures that we would look at in the future so for the next question uh, in a presentation by a psychiatrist in a recently ECOP mental health webinar he made mention of traffic as a cause of stress among workers traffic lack of ventilation and the high cost of fuel are some of the reasons why some employees oppose return of on-site work what is your take on this book? Oh yes, those are all um, stressful situation. Have that high cost of fuel, where prices would go up by you know two digits instead of one. Of course, there's a rollback, but we're not even sure how far or what until when. And then the traffic. Actually, we were thinking, you know, because of the high cost of fuel, would that mean lesser transportation out? Because that would be difficult for for the public transport, the operators, but if they still of course they continue to operate but these are conditions that really add to the stress and more so because covid is still here we are not living in a no zero covid environment we have to understand that we have to be responsible our cases definitely has gone down we have had the measures in place especially vaccination 
which was the game changer. And the health systems, the capacity of our healthcare system has also, I mean, it, it is now well placed so that healthcare workers are not in a condition where there's so much patients and they're now going back to the regular non-COVID types of diseases and seeing these patients. But again, we have to understand why the work from home or alternative work arrangements could still be beneficial. Because for many of the companies, they have seen that these kinds of arrangements can work and they have been producing the necessary and delivering the outputs, the deliverables, the outcomes, even if they were having this alternative work arrangement and with less stress to the uh, commuting public, to the workers who have to report on site, as well as they can be done. We are seeing that these kinds of hybrid type of arrangements may really be one of the arrangements that will continue even in our new normal as we speak. And it will really be it will be less stressful. But let me also tell you, some workers would like to go on, you know, report physically on site because the social meetings or, or being together with their co-workers is something they also have missed. That's also part of our connections that we have as workers. So both ways, the hybrid workplace, doing alternative work sites, and then going back to on-site work, these are the things that we should look at as the work arrangements that we will be seeing more often. Yeah, uh, as a test for the next question, the Department of Labor and uh, Employment issued Department Order Number 208 Series of 2020. And these are the guidelines for the implementation of mental health workplace policies and programs for the private sector. I know that these guidelines could be better explained in a webinar as we did as a sole topic. But for purposes of this episode, uh, can you walk us through the most important features of uh, DO208 uh, series of uh, 2020? Actually, the essence of the mental health prevention and control program for workers uh, and for workplaces to have good mental health policy and program is so that they are now looking into the awareness. We have to let the workers and the employers first, of course, bring it down the awareness on mental health, the awareness of mental health conditions. What is it in the organization that can be so stressful and that can provide or can aggravate mental health conditions to workers? We know that because of the pressures of work and then there will also be interpersonal conflicts as well as other actions that can happen among employees there can be aggravating circumstances mental health conditions will be affected so there should be a policy on zero tolerance for factors that may you know that may aggravate mental health conditions and first of all of course before that in the policy will be an awareness what is a men what is a mental good mental health program how should we approach it? What is important in terms of breaking this down? Who should be the, the persons responsible, like HR, the occupational physicians, and if you need further specialists or experts, who should these persons be? How are they uh, to be contacted by your workers if there is needed? You know, these are very important as part of the policy. Then on the program itself, for awareness, the responsibility of the employers, so that this mental health program will continue and it should be promoted in workplaces what the responsibility of the workers what is important what are the things you look out for is disclosure important we just say it's encouraged especially for those who have had some mental health conditions before because if they are taking any medication and it may provide some problems with alertness then they should not be working with machines or tools that can harm them or that can harm others. So these are very important items. And then, of course, what behavior should we look into so that we are addressing behaviors that should not be present in a workplace and that can be a factor for having such mental health issues at work, like bullying, alienating, ostracizing, even verbal abuse. All of these are behaviors that should not be tolerated and the policy should state that. And of course, if you already have an employee who may have, you know, carrying some mental health condition, then 
like you said, the services, even if it's just for referral, should be given to that worker. If we do not say that the companies will provide, at least the company should refer these workers who may have some problems already to be able to access such services as they may do. So basically, these are, and you know, if you look at the whole mental health law, there are also penalties, and we would like to avoid that. Like if you break confidentiality, these are penalties in the bigger mental health law. But for the workplace policy and program, we are looking at the program, the awareness, the responsibilities. And of course, if there's a worker who will be affected, and it is because of an incident at work, remember there can be traumas that can happen at work, then there will also be compensation that can be given to them. Doc Tess, the guidelines you mentioned make mandatory the formulation of mental health policy and program in all workplaces and establishments. So, I suppose kasama ito sa compliance requirements under Dolly's labor inspection. Based on the data available, what is the extent of compliance to this mandatory requirement? Can you also uh, share with us the reasons for non-conformances? I really don't have our, because it was a late issue in 2020, mm-hmm. but in 2021, because this is part of, part, this is really part of our checklist, let me check, but I don't have the, the figure now, I can give it to you later, but if you look at the overall, and this one I, I can recall, because in the COVID checklist, it's also, look, because mental health was part of the guidance that the COVID checklist looked into, let me say that at least the awareness and that there is a policy even and, and addressing it through a referral mechanism, the compliance rates were high. I just don't have the exact number now. Doctors, how will companies uh, benefit from having policies and operational programs on mental health? You know, COVID has exposed our vulnerability to some mental health conditions. And these are, and we all have experienced that, fear, anxiety, depression, anger. And it was, it becomes a little bit irrational. You know, we could not anymore describe the fear of not going out, uh, meeting with other people, our depression, because we also didn't know what to do. And if one gets sick, we might think right away, it is COVID and the fear of if it is COVID, what next? So if companies would have a good mental health program, would have like a hand-holding mechanism so that the employees can go and ask and they can be given the support. That is really what the mental health program is. The needed psychosocial support that everybody needs. It is creating a competency for HR, for the health personnel that are present so that they can be able to counsel in a way they're not two counselors because as we said they should be if they need to be referred but at least on a first step like a first aid type of approach and just letting the person speak being able to reach out and to see where their fears are coming from this is already good important steps and these are very important for the workers, allaying their fears, being able to talk to someone about it and someone saying, everybody feels the same way, but we have the necessary protection already in place, just follow it, but we will always, of course, be there if you need other questions, if you have other issues, these are what we would like companies to have so that the workers are not so fearful in going back to work. We all know we have to go back to work sometime. If there is no COVID, I don't think, you know, this is the, but because we still have COVID, and then we have, of course, the issues of what if, what next. The mental health program will provide the people, will provide an awareness, will provide, we hope, a page from the companies what they get. They can always look up or they can read correct information so that they can also be guided. So we are seeing that this program is very essential even after COVID, because of the what next that can happen, we do not know the future of work is so uncertain now. And all of these mental health programs will be the support needed by all our workers. So how can Dole or even ECO provide assistance to both employers, especially the MSMEs, which do not have the resources and know-how and workers so that mental health in the workplace can be better promoted 
and the stigma around mental health conditions can be debunked. You know, Echo, you have provided so much webinars. I think by this, you, can, you should still continue to provide it. We are seeing so much new information on, of course, COVID, and employers would like also to have that information, the workers as well. Please continue that awareness raising. And if you can have experts that they can call on that are part of your pool uh, of experts in the ECOP and they can access, that would also be very good because these are, remember, everybody is affected. Employers would also like to reach out so that they can help their employees and telling your members that we have this for our mental health program, we can help you in, in like writing the policy. You have trained people in your organization to help them then you have experts there also to, to assist them as well. That resource, the human resource, is so needed. And I think everybody will look at that. And, and use, using that resource, continuing webinars, would be a very good strategy as well in addressing the mental health concerns. Yeah. Doc Tess, for the last question, when does a mental health case uh, or condition uh, become a ground for uh, termination of uh, employment? And what are the procedures that must be followed? Uh, what safeguards are in place for both the worker and the employer? You know, this is a very challenging to issue because number one, this is a disease and we are trying, of course, to see how best we can address the persons affected by an illness. If it is caused by a work condition that creates an aggressive behavior or creates another, you know, an undesirable behavior, then let us try to look into how to manage that. So it's an illness, eh? and that's why the experts, the specialists, who, they, who should be consulted. And if the person would already start harming, you know, on going to work, there might be instances where harm can happen to him or his co-workers, then you have to assess that situation very well. But again, there is due process. Of course, I am from the... And all of this should be followed and before any final action can be done. But let us look at it in terms of addressing the mental health illness as an illness that can be managed. Because if it can and the worker becomes productive, and whatever is causing the mental health condition will also be able to address it or to mitigate it. I think that, that, that is what we would like at the end. Asectas, maybe have some final parting words from you? Um, do not, okay. From flexible work arrangement to mental it's what I would just like to stress is at this point where employ the you know our value of employees is we really realize it so much. And we also realize their fears. And we also realize that we have to work with this. We have to understand where it is coming from because what they fear is what we fear. And that is why what we use as our information, as our support, we provide it as well. The policy should be there. We, the dollar has already provided those guidelines. Can we use it? And let us not forget, especially in this year, we're still in the pandemic, we have COVID. Let us look at ways of protecting ourselves, of being very responsible. And let us never forget to have the necessary protection and to always follow the minimum public health standards. And at the end of the day, what we all like, of course, in the new normal or in the next normal is that we are continuing to be productive in the best way we can. Thank you very much uh, for your insights and thoughts on uh, flexible work arrangements and uh, mental health uh, in the workplace, uh, ASEC Tess Coqueco. Uh, now for our next guest, Dr. Robert Bong Venaventura. Uh, Dr. Bong? Buenaventura is the chair of the Department of Neurosciences, Manila Theological College of Medicine, a consultant psychiatrist of the University of the East Ramon Magsaysay Memorial Medical Center and Life Fellow of Philippine Psychiatric Association. Hello, Dr. Buenaventura. 
Welcome to Echo Plus, amplifying your voice. You may want to greet the viewers of uh, tonight's episode. Yes, uh, good evening, Mr. Moyan. Thank you very much for the invitation to be with you tonight. Good evening, Doc Bong. So for our first question, how is mental health defined in the general sense and how it is defined in the context of a workplace? Is there also a difference uh, about mental health and mental wellness? Uh, good evening, Mom Sheila. Yes, thank you very much for that question. In terms of the definition of mental health, let me use the World Health Organization definition. So mental health is a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. So in terms of the question of how is it defined in the context of a workplace, it should be the same because the WHO definition applies to all areas of our life, so even at home and at work. That's an interesting question about the difference between mental health and mental wellness because both terms are usually used interchangeably. But essentially, again, based on the WHO definition, when we say mental health, it refers to our mental well-being. So it's the state wherein an individual feels well, feels good. But when we talk about mental wellness, this refers to strategies that help us achieve health and well-being, such as diet, exercise, sleep, and rest. Yeah, Dr. Bong, can you tell us about the most common uh, mental health uh, illnesses in the workplace uh, before and uh, during the pandemic? Uh, that's an interesting question. Unfortunately, here in the Philippines, we have very little data on this. But using worldwide statistics, we know that even before the pandemic, we do encounter a lot of job stress, burnout, anxiety, depression in the workplace. The problem was that during the pandemic, it seemed to have magnified, although we don't have exact data, but what we do know is that the prevalence may have increased. Okay, for the next question, how do we detect if our employees or staff are already facing mental health issues? What are the telltale signs? And how do we deal with situations like this? Okay, good. So I'm glad you mentioned telltale signs. So like in my case, I would use like warning signs or red flags. Okay, so people seem to prefer the phrase red flags. Now, there are a lot of warning signs or red flags, including absenteeism, decreased productivity, poor working relationships, inability to concentrate, poor sleep, appetite, and others. Now, it would be great if a company has a point person and either in-house resources, such as a company physician or nurse, or even outside services, such as being able to contract with psychological firm or even with their HMO. That would be one of the good ways by which a company can deal with situations like this. Uh, Doc Bong, what are the common stressors in the workplace or putting it in another way? What are the conditions that may contribute in the emergence of uh, mental health issues in companies and uh, establishments? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good question because we need to consider that some of it may be internal, such as poor working conditions, poor lighting, poor ventilation. In a lot of situations, these are overlooked so that the individual may be working under circumstances that may be detrimental to their health. It, they, it could also include low salary, poor benefits, difficult working relationships, for example, personal differences with their boss or other work colleagues, long work hours, for example, like working beyond the usual allotted working hours and then not get, being able to get, let's say, uh, overtime pay. But we need to consider also that not all the factors are internal because there are also a lot of external factors. This could include commuting in traffic, you know, family illness, bills that they need to pay, for example, like also including not having a kasambahay or someone to help them with household chores. You know? So there are a lot of factors that uh, we can consider and we need to uh, understand also that not all the common stressors can be found in the workplace. They can also exist outside of the workplace. Uh, Doc Bong, follow-up question. During the pandemic, did you see a rise in the number of your patients, uh, especially those dealing with uh, anxiety, uh, mm -hmm. stress? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Again, just looking at it from the perspective of, let's say, corporate work in the workplace. You know, I, because this is something that I can 
really talk about in, in, based on my experience in the last couple of years. When the pandemic started in March 2020, and soon after that, I was engaged by several companies because they did notice that a lot of their employees, and not just employees, but even the managers, were suffering from you know, mental health symptoms. So what I did was, you know, I gave them the usual discussions about the uh, response, psychosocial responses to the pandemic and then the mental wellness strategies that they could employ. So I just wanted to emphasize that it's not just, for example, the rank and file that would be affected, but managers as well, even directors. In fact, with some companies that I would have separate meetings or discussions with managers and separate discussions with associates or employees simply because their roles are different and their needs are different okay and then i've had business owners who came to me because of the financial impact of the pandemic on their businesses no? that they've been unable to open up shop and then been unable to earn or even pay their employees so it was a huge burden on them so both employer and employees were almost equally i'm not saying of course equally but i'm saying that they were both significantly affected by the restrictions that were imposed by the pandemic so we need to understand that these may be common responses, but individuals in this situation may also benefit from some degree of uh, psychosocial assistance. Okay. Doc Bong, you mentioned a while ago different factors um, related to the stressors in the workplace. So for this time, can you describe or share with us dispositional or contextual factors that shape employees' well-being? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's a very complex question you know, and probably someone with a background in organizational psychology might be in a better position to answer this, but I'll take a stab at it. You see, we need to separate the two first because they're different. When you say dispositional, this refers to the individual's abilities and capacities. Contextual factors refer to the situation, okay? So, and it, it should be the same because how we interact or how we relate to a given situation is generally the same in terms of different aspects of our lives. We dispose, for example, like common dispositional variables would include optimism, our sense of optimism, our ability to be affected negatively easily. Okay, So regardless of whether it's at work or at home or at school, uh, it, it should be similar. I think that, that what would vary would be the contextual factors because when we look at that contextual factors, we have those factors that would support and those factors that would thwart the individual. So looking at it from that perspective, since we've already mentioned some of the factors before, no? we need to be able to understand how each one of us would deal with a particular challenge. And then companies would also need to understand whether the work environment is supportive of the individual or is the work environment not supportive the individual. So that's why it's important for both employer and employee to look in terms of the situation and be able to discuss this because, you know, this will, at the end, shape the employee's well-being. So that if we have more supportive contextual factors, then that would, of course, be better for the individual. If the individual has a better disposition, such as a more positive outlook in life, then again, that would lead to a better well-being on the part of the employee. Based on studies and uh, researches, what demographics are most at risk? Uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to mental health uh, illnesses? Okay, uh, uh, that's an interesting question simply because that first we must remember that vulnerability to, towards uh, mental health conditions will vary, will change over time. I say it will depend on the individual's current circumstances. Like earlier, we were talking about dispositional and contextual factors. We need to remember that, for example, having nothing, contextual factors may change but hopefully an individual's dispositional factors may remain the same. And so therefore, this would be important to understand as well. When we talk in terms of demographics, I say, at risk are those who have poor coping skills. So those individuals who do not have very good dispositional skills, like in mga pessimistic, you know, who tend to be very negative individuals who often, when their initial reaction to a situation is always negative, you know, they always see the problem, but not the solution, okay? Uh, we need to understand as well an individuals with a history of personal or family mental illness because they can be more vulnerable as well. And even individuals who have medical illness, but such as hypertension, diabetes, you know, there's a higher association 
with uh, mental health conditions, with individuals who have medical illnesses as well. And then individuals who are going through, shall we say, very difficult life circumstances. Uh, like, for example, they live alone, there's a, there's a lack of psychosocial support, you know, they're going through a bad patch as far as their personal relationships are concerned. So these individuals will be the ones who are, who are going to be vulnerable. And that's why it's going to be very challenging to be able to identify them because there can be so many complex factors to consider. But at the end of the day, if we have someone who will be able to listen to them and help them, then we, at least we, can, we will be able to identify these individuals at risk. Doc Bong, as we all know, the pandemic has changed the way we work. How can we better manage stress and avoid work burnout? In an ideal world, we'll, we'll be able to avoid burnout. You know? in, a, in an ideal world, there will be no job burnout. But since it's, it's not an ideal world, then what I would first suggest is that companies should take the time to evaluate their current work practices. Since you said know? it earlier, it's the contextual factors. You know? So that, for example, like right now, considering the, you know, the pandemic, so if they're working on-site, do employees have a good, are there, is there a good work environment? I mentioned earlier about, you know, or things that minor things that we tend to overlook like lighting, ventilation, the availability of uh, potable drinking water you know, in the workplace. So that would be helpful. But if the individual is working from home, we need to understand whether the company has specific policies that allow employees to be productive within a home setting as well. You know. Early on in the pandemic, this was one of the critical issues that faced companies and employees, no? uh, there were no clear policies as far as work from home situation was concerned. So that there was a lot of confusion, a lot of difficulties or challenges as a result of that. That's why it's important also for, for companies, therefore, to have overarching or general policies that would enhance life work balance. You know? And a good question also would be, do they have an occupational health and safety resource you know, within the company or even some something that they can outsource to. Uh, does the company have wellness initiatives that can be very helpful to the employee? In this situation, I would uh, suggest uh, consulting the Department of Labor, Administrative Order Number 28 that, that they released in February 2020, yeah. and also the World Health Organization guidelines in terms of mental health in the workplace that was released in 2019. For the follow-up question, um, how can employers include mental health services in their current HMO packages? So most oh, HMOs mm. exclude psychiatry and neurology services. I think the best way to deal with that is for companies simply to talk with their HMOs. I've worked with an HMO in which they were able to get, they, that the, in which they have three or four clients who have included uh, mental health consultations, counseling, and other forms of mental health services in their HMO package. So it's basically going to be up to the company and the HMO to discuss that. Because of course, this involves uh, additional resources on the part of the company. So they just need to be able to find, let's say, so shall we say a package that will be feasible for the company at the same time, still beneficial for the employee. Uh, Doc Bong, uh, what is your take on uh, employers requiring uh, mental tests as part of uh, the recruitment and uh, pre-employment uh, process? And how do we ensure that this does not become a tool for uh, uh, discrimination? Mm -hmm. I know with some companies, for example, intelligence and personality testing are standard. So, those are mental tests as well. Okay. But if you're referring to, let's say, screening an individual who has depression or psychosis, now that's a different matter altogether. Mm -hmm. It can be, say for example, like kung IQ screening lang yan or personality assessment. A lot of psychometricians can do that. But if the company wants to screen individuals for mental health conditions, then you need to engage an expert in being able to do that because that is not something that, uh, let's say, shall we say a psychometrician will be able to do. You need someone who has a solid background in cl either clinical psychology or psychiatry to be able to do that. And at the same time, I would suggest checking with Dole about this you know, because it's basically, it, my, my opinion would not matter if Dole has specific guidelines about this process. Yeah, uh, Doc Bong, may we have your final words uh, specifically from the perspective of why should companies, uh, you know, 
uh, put in place uh, mental health policies and uh, uh, programs? Yes. Well, first and foremost, because it's already part of our mental health law, so Section 25 of Republic Act 11036 mandates companies to provide mental health services for their employees. You know. And, you know, it, it's, it's not just a matter of being able to comply with the law, but we need to understand that there is no health without mental health and that the consideration of uh, an employee's well-being would be very important as far as overall productivity. In fact, a study has shown that when a company invests at least $1 in terms of ensuring an improved mental health state of their employee, they get $4 in return. Okay, so that means investing in the employee's mental health will have a significant return on investment. And this can lead to, as we said, better productivity, more harmonious working relationships within the office, you know, and employees, and not just employees, but the entire company being able to achieve its goals. And you said, diba, kasi we're also concerned about the bottom line because that can be a guarantee as well. So that's why I hope that companies would really put more importance on their employees' mental health and well-being so that, you know, at the end, because it's going to be a win-win situation for everyone at the end of the day. And with that, I'd like to thank ECOP again. So thank you, Mr. Moya. Thank you, Mom Sheila, for this opportunity to be with you tonight. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bong Buenaventura, for the very fruitful uh, discussion. Before we proceed to our last guest for tonight, mga ka ECOP, we will be right back after this segment. Philwen believes that effective collaboration with like-minded organizations is key to pursuing advocacies for workplace gender equality, women's economic empowerment, and diversity and inclusion. ECOP and Philwen's work in the business sector are aligned. We work with companies through evidence-based strategies, capacity building activities, and tools for workforce development. Our membership in ECOP and our role as co-chair of the Revived Diversity and Inclusion Committee is a testament to the importance of DNI in business and socio-economic development. As the voice of Filipino employers, we in Philwin are committed to support ECOP in creating workplaces that are enabling and thriving. Through our partnership, we wish to influence other business organizations to be our allies. We look forward to continuing this collaboration with you. And we're back. Welcome again to Echo Plus, amplifying your voice. I am Jose Roland Moya, and uh, allow me to introduce our last guest for tonight, Mr. Joseph Christian Reyes, Chief Human Resources Officer of FEU, Dr. Nicanor Reyes medical foundation hello mr joey reyes uh, welcome to echo plus amplifying your voice why don't you greet the viewers of tonight's episode hello uh good evening everyone uh good evening sir roland uh good evening sheila thank you for having me uh, it's nice to be here on your show today yeah joey tell us something about your company uh FEU Dr. Nicanor Reyes uh, Medical Foundation. How many employees do you have? Uh, when was the foundation uh, established? Uh, uh, and where is it located? Okay. Well, currently we are we have 900 employees. We're a hospital and a school. Uh, we were established actually in 1952. The Institute of Medicine of uh, FEU was established, and later on in in 1971 it was converted to a non-stop non-profit organization, which is the FEU NRMF Dr. Nicanor Reyes Medical Foundation. This used to be in the campus of FEU in Moraita, Manila. It was both a hospital and an institute of medicine, so a school of medicine. And later on, in 1999, this foundation moved to the underserved community of, of Fairview, Quezon City. And that's where we are, Regalado Avenue, West Fairview, Quezon City. And from that time, we've expanded from a School of Medicine. We now have eight 
different programs aside from medicine we have allied health programs such as uh, nursing med tech uh, pt pharmacy and nutrition grad tech respiratory therapy yeah and from 1952 all the way to today we're proud to say the school has been uh, consistently producing top quality graduates we've been uh, above the national passing rate consistently and we've also been recognized as one of the top performing schools of the country by the PRC. Yeah, thank you Joey for those uh, information. Now we get to the substance of our uh, interview tonight. Uh, Sheila, why don't you ask the first question? Okay, good evening Sir Joey. So for our first question, why is mental health and wellness important to companies and establishments? Well, even prior to the pandemic, we all know mental health awareness was, was already a thing. So we, we actually had uh, Republic Act 11036 to, to strengthen that. Mental health of, of everybody, you know, from students to employees, was already a hot topic. Of course, with the pandemic in uh, 2020, uh, we all know that it made things a lot worse for everybody to cope with all the changes that came about with the pandemic, especially you can say for, for our setting, our company, because we're we're in the health industry, so we were really at the front lines of, of, of this pandemic. So it was important for us to, to make sure that our employees who are handling the sick people of the pandemic had to be in the best of mental health or the best of their great capabilities. So of course, needless to say, it, it's very dramatic for them, especially during the height of the pandemic when you can say that the death rate of the of COVID-19 was quite high. But that sense, no, of course, we have to keep it, make sure that, that we have the mental health of our employees in check for the good of themselves also because you know, of what they were going through. Um, from the company's standpoint, naman, of course, addressing mental health issues lead to productivity. You have good, happy workers. Needless to say that you, you will have less absenteeism and of course, the ones that are at work will be more productive as well, uh, which will uh, lead to financial gains for the company as well. Uh, Joey, do you have a system in place to measure the rates of both absenteeism and uh, presenteeism, uh, which is uh, being unproductive while present at work in your organization? And what percentage of this may be related to uh, psychological health and safety issues, especially during the pandemic. Okay. Um, well, for for absenteeism, of course, we have our, our attendance, which, which everybody has, and that's one way we can monitor the absentees. And of course, you have to give the reason why they were not able to go to work. In terms of presenteeism, naman, we have our PMS, so our performance management system, and. Through that, of course, you're able to, to monitor the performance of your employee. But in that system, we, we have a performance dialogue which allows us or the head to delve deeper into the reasons why certain employees could be underperforming at work. So, um, of course, there are issues that get picked up that are directly, shall we say, related to or can be pointed to mental health as, as their group. There are also some uh, uh, perhaps Indirectly, uh, mental health also contributes to the poor performance of, of the employee when they have a lot of times they have either financial or, or personal problems at home, which uh, leads them to have to not be able to report to work or of course their focus when they're at work is greatly diminished when they have uh, big problems at home. In terms of the percentage, I would say about 60% of, of those problems uh, we can relate to uh, mental health. Okay, so other than what you have mentioned, what other policies, programs, activities, and practices have the companies embarked on to promote mental health and wellness, especially during the pandemic? How were all this designed considering the situation of your employees who were on remote work? Yeah, so like I mentioned, we're both a hospital and a school, which were two very different uh, working environments. So with the school, bawal kayo pumasok, but schools weren't allowed to, to have people inside the building. And so obviously, everything was remote for school. But, but for the hospital, obviously, it was a different thing. Kailangan lahat kayo pumasok. We had to, as I said, be at the, the forefront of the pandemic. So we had to have activities that would cater both on-site work as well as remote work. But thankfully, everybody knows Zoom. Uh, Zoom took off during the pandemic and that helped us in terms of connecting 
everybody. Kasi kahit naman, even if, say, we were going to work during the pandemic, no one would really go around. No? We, we discourage people going office to office, having close contact just to, for safety purposes, no? to, to prevent any possible infection going through the hospital. So we really need Zoom. We really needed Zoom to connect everybody. So, so we had social programs uh, that was done through Zoom. Of course, we had our LMC. Our labor management committee changed to a Zoom Zoom meetings, and that's where a lot of our sources of information, and that's where a lot of programs rooted from. Now, thankfully, with our training also from ECO and the Danish industry on bipartisan, I believe it was really helpful also during this pandemic. No? So management and the union was really able to come together and come up with different programs. Uh, to address the needs of our employees. We had physical activities, which was done through Zoom. We also had a wellness through movement program, which is more of physical fitness, uh, more of uh, strength and a bit of, uh, bit of cardio. But of course, very basic so that we could cater to all levels, all fitness levels of our employees. I personally believe it was it's very important to move and, and to sweat and to be active part of mental health so that was one thing we did of course the mental health part we also had uh, we had intensive programs uh, especially with our emergency room department we had mental health debriefing and psychosocial support programs which was done through zoom as well of course the facilitators of the meeting could not join us in our emergency room so we had to do it through zoom and yeah it was very very helpful for our frontliners to be able to just discuss and talk about their experiences as i said especially early on in the pandemic as they were adjusting to all the changes that were happening. Yeah, the recent one, our most recent one, we're just about to finish a personal development program in partnership with ICF Philippines. It's basically one-on-one -on -one coaching with our employees, whether you're a manager or rank and file, uh, you're assigned a coach where you can have one-on-one -on -one coaching with that coach, no? uh, up to three sessions with, with your coach. And the topics that you you can bring up or the things that you want to be coached on are anything you want. It wasn't uh, limited to productivity or, or work. Uh, we allowed them to bring up anything. Okay, of course, in confidence, uh, confidentiality was, was made certain by our ICF coaches. But yeah, they were, they were allowed to talk about any of their personal goals or personal problems that they had and the coach was able to help them uh, address it talk through things and, and help them be on the right path to achieve their goals and i believe that was one of our very fruitful programs you could see the positive effect it had on our employees yeah uh, joey on-site uh, work will become uh, inevitable can you describe to us the kind of a return to work policy that takes into account the emotional, psychological, and interpersonal challenges that you intend to put in place uh, in your company as we get back to uh, quote-unquote yeah. uh, normalcy? Well, I guess we, we've been very flexible, and very understanding in terms of the current conditions of our employees. Recently, we have level 1, Natalia, so we've been instructing our, our employees to go back to work. Of course, we being sensitive to whatever adjustments that they will need to do after being used to being on remote work for quite some time. We give them sort of a grace period or, or a time to adjust. We give them ample time for them to prepare and get ready for the on-site work. You know? And of course, for those that are already for our hospital, because we, we, like I mentioned, we, we've been on on-site work for throughout the pandemic. So I guess for them, there was no adjustment daily. But for the ones that we had to request to go back to work, like for example, we had one person who asked for 30 days extension because she had to look for a place near the office. Given that their work could be monitored and could be done online, we allowed them the extension for, for them to take care of what they had to do so that they can come back to work with ease. So yeah, I think it's it's really the flexible work arrangement and, and being sensitive to the adjustment period that they will be doing. How will the union or employee representatives play a role to play in the return to work process, including having the opportunity to provide inputs on the return to work 
Like I mentioned earlier, we have a strong labor management committee. Our union officers were also trained through ECO together with the Danish industry bipartisan. So through that committee, they are able to be heard and they're able to bring to management, bring to light uh, different situations or different issues that they currently face. So from that level, we're able to hear it and we're able to to address it. So for example, before we, we found out a lot of people during the pandemic, of course, couldn't go to work. Uh, could have, sorry, couldn't go home you know, or did not want to go home just for fear of bringing home the virus being infected. And uh, through that, we, we opened up one of our buildings to convert it to shelter for our employees. On the flip side, naman, of course, with, with this on-site work coming back, we've strengthened our uh, shuttle services for our employees to help them with the transition of, of their commute uh, back to work as well. Yeah, Joey, you already made mention of your LMC, the Labor Management Committee, which is a platform or a venue for social dialogue between uh, management and uh, uh, workers. But uh, do you have referral programs, surveys, or regular consultations uh, between uh, management and uh, uh, workers? Well, we have our reviews. We have our PMS. Uh, together with that, we have required the head to have a dialogue with their subordinate. And of course, the that gets cascaded upward you know, if anything comes up through that. A lot of things come through the LMC. We also have Facebook groups. We have uh, Facebook GCs. We actually have also a Facebook group specifically for mental health. Uh, we have an FEU NRMF uh, mental health support group. That's where uh, post any activities uh, specifically regarding mental health. We also have our mental health officer as well as the certain employees on the ground level to inform us of any issues that they see specifically regarding mental health. Uh, of course, we've had a few during the pandemic and it was through those channels that we were able to identify potential uh, employees that were perhaps distressed that needed mental health support and we're able to give them the appropriate attention. Okay, so as you mentioned, most of the programs and activities are handled by the LMC. So what are the challenges you faced in crafting or implementing and sustaining your mental health programs? I guess the first problem I would say is there is maybe stigma or a hesitancy from the employees to join or to participate in any mental health program. Uh, like for example, the coaching that I mentioned earlier. It took quite a few sessions of orientation just to encourage them to to join it, to go through it. And thankfully enough, when they actually went through it, they, they reported great benefit from it. They realized that they need it or there's, there's a lot to gain from, from going through it. So yeah, so I think that on one end, there is that, the, the hesitancy by the individuals, by the employees to, to, to participate and join in, in the programs. That would be the number one problem but thankfully i think the the stigma so to speak around mental health is sort of fading away and, and slowly people are being more open to it in fact more proactive to addressing mental health uh, joey may we have uh, your final words uh well thank you sarola thank you sheila for this interview of course thank you echo for setting this up to echo plus glad to have shared what we've been through throughout this pandemic and i hope we can all learn from each other and share whatever best practices the other companies are doing and, and perhaps together we can all help improve specifically in the mental health aspect of of companies uh, today. So again, thank you, Eko, and uh, thank you to our host today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Joey Reyes, for sharing your company's policies, practices, and uh, experiences related to uh, mental health in the workplace. Thank you for the very fruitful discussion, Joey. Thank you, everyone. Let's have a short break for the Echo Plus Amplifying Your Voice Netizens Q&A. Interested in getting familiar with a single and official voice of Philippine employers? Want to stay updated on the latest news and trends on labor and social policy issues? By becoming a member of ECOP, you can have access to all of these and many more. Explore the benefits of joining ECOP. 
ECLOP provides its members with a comprehensive range of services that includes training, advocacy, and information through seminars, research publications and networking. The ECLOP Help Desk provides assistance to members who may have questions or concerns on issues regarding human resource management, HRM, industrial relations, IR, and occupational safety and health, OSH. Managed and operated internally using ECLOP facilities and technical staff, the Help Desk can be easily accessed through multiple platforms. We regularly conduct free webinars to keep our constituents in the business community abreast with the latest and upcoming developments on industrial relations, social policies, and related topics. Aside from free webinars, we offer to members big discounts in our public training programs, seminars, and workshops on IR, HR, OSH, and a lot more. Philippine employers are represented by ECOP in various tripartite bodies. ECOP's participation in congressional hearings and other policy consultations ensures that the voice of employers is articulated, heard and acted upon. As a member, you can network and join events that bring together company representatives to discuss developments and issues on industrial relations and human resources management through our members' general meeting, MGM. Aside from this, you can attend, discover ECOP, an interactive forum organized for members and non-members alike to familiarize them with ECOP's advocacies, activities, and programs. An overview of pending labor bills in Congress and proposed policy issuances discussed in the Technical Executive Committee of the Department of Labor and Employment are usually presented. We provide a learning and sharing platform among representatives of our member companies through our ECOP networks. ECOP Networks has three fields of specialization which are, Industrial Relations and Human Resources, IRHR, Occupational Safety and Health, OSH, and Corporate Social Responsibility and Responsible Business Conduct, CSR, RBC. As a member company, your management or HR representatives will have the opportunity to receive full overseas technical scholarship on topics such as industrial relations, human resource management, and occupational safety and health organized in Japan. ECOP also organizes the annual National Conference of Employers, where our members enjoy discounts when participating. Lastly, you will enjoy other benefits such as up-to-date, informative e-bulletin and research publications. We provide our members up-to-date and relevant news, studies and statistics gathered from reputable agencies as well as trends and practices directly collected from various industries. Our members can enjoy 50% discount on research publications such as Corporate Compensation Survey and CBA Report. Free conferences, workshops, or seminars by invitation through ECOP Special Projects. Exclusive access to members only page in the ECOP website where you can review different project tools, documents, copies of position papers, minutes of committee meeting, and loads of other records. ECOP Plus, amplifying your voice is ECOP's digital television program that airs regularly in various social media platforms. The program discusses ECOP's advocacies and programs. It also features interviews with employers, practitioners and policy makers on current, evolving and future workplace issues. Airs twice a month, 5.30 p.m., on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. As our members continue to grow their businesses, ECOP will always continue its mandate of protecting the interest and advocating the welfare of the business community. Discover the many ways you can support your business or enterprise today. Join the Employers' Confederation of the Philippines. Your partner. Your advocate. The single and official voice of the Philippine employers on labor and social policy issues.
Sheila, we are now in the Echo Plus uh, Netizens Corner segment of the show. Let's take uh, a question from our netizens. And this question is coming from Echo's uh, social media account, specifically from uh, Joy Zelino, which she posted in Echo's uh, Facebook page. The question of uh, Joy is this. Hi, Echo. I am a small business owner employing around 20 employees. We are all on hybrid work arrangement. I want to install an employee wellness program. How do I start? Uh, Sheila, you may want to, uh, you know, help me answer this question uh, of Joy. So Joy can start by getting in touch with us. So through our OSH Academy, we can offer trainings and consultancy services for companies like you. So we can help you develop, install, and implement your mental health program. Yeah, and it is uh, quite important, imperative for us to meet with you so that we can learn about your employees' uh, demographics and, of course, the capacity of your company to implement uh, specific programs. But uh, definitely, uh, ECOP can help you uh, design the appropriate programs, policies, and uh, uh, interventions so that you can have the buy-in from your uh, management and of course uh, the support of your uh, uh, workers and how can joy uh, get in touch with uh, us uh, specifically through our osh academy uh, sheila so you can visit our website it's www.ecop.org.ph and you can visit our available trainings under the ECOP OSH Academy. Likewise, you can also visit our ECOP Facebook page. Please type in Employers Confederation of the Philippines and you can send us a message there. Oh, Sheila, maganda yung naging tanong ni Joy kasi alam naman natin na both uh, physical and mental uh, well-being of uh, employees are uh, very crucial in ensuring that uh, they remain happy, productive, uh, and this can result to, you know, uh, higher uh, productivity uh, in the workplace. So thank you very much, Joy, for your uh, question. For our netizens, uh, kanina binanggit namin ang Echo Plus question for the day. Na dapat abangan para manalo ng papremyo. Ito po ang Echo Plus question for the day. Anong department order number and series ang nabanggit ng ating unang panauhin na naglalama ng guidelines for the implementation of mental health workplace policies and programs for the private sector? Sheila, paano ba sasagutin ang Echo Plus question for the day? Ito ang ating mga mechanics. Una, i-comment ang sagot sa Facebook account ng Echo. Hashtag Echo Plus Amplifying Your Voice Space Your Answer Space Anong Title ng Episode na ito. Don't forget to like and share ang episode na ito sa Echo Facebook page. Ang mapipiling mananalo ay inonotify sa Echo Facebook page at bibigyan namin ng instructions kung paano makukuha ang premyo. Thank you so much, Asek Tesco Cueco, Dr. Robert Buenaventura, and uh, Mr. Joey uh, Reyes for your time. Maraming salamat kay Joyce sa yung katanungan. Sana ay nasagot namin ni uh, Sheila ito. Huwag nyo pong kalimutan sagutin ang Echo Plus question for the day. I-like at i-share ang episode na ito para manalo ng premyo. Mga ka Echo, I'm your host, Jose Roland Moya with my co-host. I'm Sheila Ramos and see you every other Monday at 5.30pm sa next episode ng Echo, Echo Plus, Plus amplifying, amplifying your, your voice. voice. Stay safe and God bless everyone.